Right, we better get going, otherwise we're going to miss all the discussion. So welcome to the Imperial Brain Lates, and I'm Professor Sarah Rankin, and my co-host tonight is, um, we're not related, but the Huyna Rankin from the RCA. So Huyna and I both, both part of the staff student uh, neurodiversity network that we call Neurodiversity in Albertopolis because it encompasses Imperial, the RCA, the RCM and the BMA because we like doing interdisciplinary things and that's how our brains work. Um, so NDIA was formed in the spring of 2019. Obviously you know what that means. This is our first face-to-face <laughs> -face meeting. So we are Seriously overexcited to be here and meeting the rest of our neuro tribe face to face. So, yeah, very um, excited. So, this evening we're going to be celebrating cognitive diversity in business, hence, we're in the business school for change. And um, yes, and we've got esteemed panelists here, but before we move on to them, uh, let's Probably give us some of the house rules. So, yeah, the house rules are that there aren't any house rules, really. <laughs> um, just suggestions. So, please feel free to get up, move around if you want to, have a stretch. And also, very excitingly, we're giving you permission to doodle. In fact, we'd like you to doodle, and that's why there are various bits of paper and pens around. Um, and uh, there's also a flip chart there and some pens. So if anyone has the urge to do a drawing, don't hold back. We'd, we'd love to see that. Yeah, so if anybody, um, just quick hands up, anybody that used to doodle in school. Great. So channel that doodling energy. We are all avid doodlers, doodlers here. Yeah. <laughs> do we're doodling up here. <laughs> Um, and I'd now like to introduce Sean Weldon, who's a very experienced education needs teacher. And Sean is going to facilitate the doodling process. So, Sean, could you start by telling us why you think doodling is important, especially for ND students and pupils, given that it's still something that's outlawed in schools? <laughs> Yes, given that it is still outlawed in schools, much as we try to persuade teachers that actually there's something to be said for it, in fact, quite a lot to be said for it. Um, uh, and I, so many doodlers in the audience, you probably know yourselves that actually to concentrate while you're listening to something, it, it's sometimes a very, it, it keeps you there, keeps you in the room. Um, an experiment was set up by Jackie Andrade from the School of Psychology in Plymouth in 2009 just to have a look at what happens and she, uh, she's got a group of participants, she split them in half, one group she gave paper uh, with shapes on it and pencils to shade those shapes, the other group she gave nothing, she, both groups listened to uh, quite a monotonous phone call uh, about party invitation list and at the end of that experiment uh, she found doing it more than once that each time the people who were doodling were able to remember 29% on average more than the people who were not doodling so that's quite a good argument for school uh, so that's the and uh, the other thing that I was just going to say briefly is that in looking at doodling, I came across um, uh, the fact that the mathematician Stanislaw Ulam, uh, he discovered his graphic representation for prime numbers, which is a spiral, while he was doodling in a lecture at college. So that's, that's one of the... For, for neurodiverse students, the other reason that it's a useful thing is because it uses both sides of the brain. So you're listening... Uh, you've got the language centre working, but also you start to make the visual cortex work and your hand, and it, both sides working together, aids memory. So that's... Great, so we're going to put it to the test. <laughs> the test. Um, so please, doodle away. John okay. is going to be 
pleasing to encourage that people. Anybody else that feels like they want to come up with that? Yes, on the vision line, so just come and we'll do a... Okay. And while we um, start talking and having this discussion, what we're going to do is Sean's going to show us um, some of her family duties. Yeah. 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 Um, and how they have, uh, <laughs> what they have done to their old telephone. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and and some other duties from other from other famous people. people. Yeah. So, right, quick introduction there. So um, we've done housekeeping, etc. So let's get back to neurodiversity. So the movement in the UK has really gained momentum, I'd say, particularly over the last five years. And given that neurodiversity was originally classified as a learning disability. It's interesting that this movement is essentially being driven um, from businesses and the business sector, oh, business sector um, by professionals like our panelists tonight. Um, so, briefly to introduce you, we have on this end Lucy Hopp, um, expert creative marketing. Um, been an MD advocate for the IT and creative industries for many years and set up The Future is MD, which is an excellent name. I'm glad you annoyed you got there. <laughs> but that's you, for marketing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then we have Naomi Johnson. No, Naomi, you're going to. Yeah, right, I, will, I will do that bit because. So I, um, I sit in Amazon, I'm doing this for myself though, however, not for Amazon today. Um, but I am the co-director of the neurodiversity of the people with disabilities affinity group, which is with the PRG, so employee resource group for global. And I also am the disability strategy lead across Europe and Middle East North Africa. Um, and but that's on the back of 20 years in IT and tech, followed by moving into that completely randomly due to my diagnosis of autistic, ADHD, dyspraxic, hyperlexic, um, in the late 37. Um, and read that, not even going past GCSE in school. And um, we've also got Helen Needham, who works for Capco and has won numerous awards. She's also given a, a TEDx talk, um, and she's autistic and hosts a website. <coughs> Me decoded for blogs around neurodiversity. Brilliant. And finally, Richard Addison, senior partner from Ernst and Young, and Richard has ADHD. So, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and ADHD are all classified as specific learning disabilities. It's probably more useful to consider them as processing differences that impact not only how you learn but also how you work and how you live. And importantly, they're not something you grow out of. And they're invisible. Right, so all of our panel members, like myself, are people that were not diagnosed um, while at school and had a diagnosis sort of later in life. And so what I want to do, and I'm going to start with Helen, because she's behaving. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to tell us your experience of well, well why did you seek out a diagnosis and what was the impact of it for you personally oh yeah um okay so um why did i get desires at the ripe old age of 40 ish uh, to, to go forward and, and uh, get myself assessed. Um, well, the story is not going to like this. It started when I was young. I've got to start back to school. Uh, I'm telling my life story. <laughs> um, in in no, a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> After, I think, at school I'd always stood out as the nerd and was quite popular and the outsider. At university, I upgraded to geek. I was out of the outside and I thought, well, wait, but when I get to work, then things are going to change. And I got to work and at work, 
I was the abrasive one, the difficult one, the one who was good at their job, but didn't quite get on with people. Can you hear me now? Oh. Um, so, um, sorry if you missed the bits, you'll need to catch up later. Um, but, and so I spent about 15 years in a very people focused job. I'm a management consultant and I went into it thinking I was going to learn about how banks work and I was going to work through their systems. And what I discovered is that 70% of my job is about people. Um, and I struggle when it comes to people quite often. I have chronic social anxiety, which most people don't realize. I have lots of strategies and structures in place. I have lots of scripts in my head that I use to facilitate conversations. Um, and so I hid that for a very long time. And as a management consultant, the better you do, the more you rise up in the organization, you get rewarded with more people. And, uh, um, you know, which, you know, was great to a point, but then there were just people everywhere. You know, there was clients, there was partners, there were colleagues, you know, I, I was the ultimate micromanager. People didn't like that. Um, and I started to struggle in the workplace with huge anxiety. And I'd put myself on social boot camp for seven years. I tried to find different playbooks, what to do, what not to do. And I tried to evolve into the social butterfly and all I got was a massive reward of anxiety and started to doubt whether I had what it takes to be successful. Now, through that process, my son was diagnosed as autistic. He'd struggled in school and I saw the change in putting him into the right environment and a school that supported him and understood him and the changes that made for him. And I started to think about my own struggles and learned a lot um, about other people who had grown up and been diagnosed as autistic later in life. And I remember reading a Guardian article and I was like, oh my, that's me. Um, and then went through the process of getting diagnosed. Um, within six months of starting to understand that I didn't need to change who I was. I needed to change the way that I worked. It wasn't that there was something wrong with me. It wasn't that I wasn't likable. It wasn't that I didn't have what it takes to be successful. It was that my brain works differently. And within a year of that, I'd gone from struggling with underperformance, having my ability as a consultant questioned, um, being viewed as difficult and challenging to growing my team from a team of two to a team of 30, which as a management consultant, that's big tick, tick, tick. That's lots of money for the consultancy. Um, and suddenly I'd learned the art of consulting by outsourcing my sociability. I got a fellow colleague who did all the social kind of maneuverings for me and we partnered. Um, and off the back of that was able to do a lot of the work that was expected of me but focus on the thing that I was really good at, which is problem solving. And at the end of the day, that's what our clients want. You know, you can't just sell for the sake of selling. You need to have people who know how to solve for problems. And, um, you know, that's been the big lesson for me and the big changes. Thank you. Thank you. And, um... As we say, Helen has an amazing TED talk that elaborates a lot more on that. So, yeah, if you're interested, have a look at that on uh, on YouTube. So, um, Lucy, hello. hello. So you're a, a late diagnosis and a double 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 diagnosis. double diagnosis. So, yeah, just give us a little rundown of your journey. Quite quite you can hear like double from that. Yeah. So keep it down. down a bit. Okay. So um, I. Is that okay? So, about so in my mid forties as well, I had got got a diagnosis of ADHD, which um, made complete sense of my kind of creative brain and my chaotic sort of life style. Um, and then two years ago, and then then from doing the kind of the neurodiversity work and sort of reading lots of blogs and stuff about neurodivergent women, and particularly autistic women, I realised that 
I related to a lot of that. So two years ago, I got a diagnosis, a diagnosis of autism. So I've got the ADHD and autism, which is the kind of order and chaos. And I sort of find my, my way sort of, sort of trying to make <laughs> order out of the chaos. It's probably a, sort of a way to put it, really. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so, you can work succinct. Very good. So, Richard, I'm just, just going to take up with you. No, I'm just, yeah, sorry, sorry, mm. Ben, don't take the person. Um, so, I just, you know, for some people in the audience that might not have a diagnosis, so from your perspective, why do you think it's important for people to, to get the diagnosis? What, 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 I guess for me, it's sort of start to understand. When you understand things, then you can adapt and things start to make sense. Because, you know, I'm ADD. I was diagnosed about five years ago. I've also got lots of dyslexic traits. And I, when somebody talks about autistic traits, I think I've also got some of those and that, some of that. And whenever somebody talks about something, you sort of think, well, might it, it's a bit of a mixture. So much, so many overlaps. Yeah, yeah, so many overlaps. And for me, my, you know, my career has turned out well, but it has been a roller coaster ride. When I've, things have gone well, I've drastically outperformed. When things have gone badly, well, it's not, you know, it's, it's been challenging. And you then you get the mental health type issues, you, you get really beaten up. And part of it is you sort of look back, and if it starts to make sense, you go, actually, that wasn't so weird. It all sort of falls into place. It's not. It's not such a strange thing. It's not me. It's, it's you know something strange about me. It's sort of normal because I now know how, how it works. And also, I have two daughter, I have daughters, and it has been a huge benefit with them understanding where things come from. And they're completely different. One is doing post grad research, and the other is a makeup artist who is in, she's really really bright, but has the tension span of a of a of a fly on 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 on, on sort of drugs, you just <laughs> bounce around the place. <laughs> right? so, and you know, and she she did well academically, but just did never want to go further. And then putting it in context and going, actually, this sort of makes sense. And it's nice to feel that you know what's going on around you. That context of what's going on around you makes it just makes me feel more secure. Makes me feel I understand more of what's what's happening around me. Does anybody want to? Pick, Anybody want to pick up in terms of the, you know, the kids? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I'm a similar story to everyone here. I got diagnosed as my son was. So I've got a son who is eight and a daughter who's six. Uh, my son is autistic, ADHD, dyspraxic, dyslexic. I have to think about all these things. Um, and my daughter is a question mark, and we've left her as a question mark because we're going to see where she goes and things. And at the moment, she's perfectly happy. But in our family, we brought them up knowing that neurodiversity is absolutely fine. This is what it is. But everyone has their label. Everyone is successful with their label because what we do is we said, everybody's brain's different just the way that everybody's hair color is different. So, for instance, Robin, my son, his brain likes fluffy things and it doesn't like loud noises. My brain likes this and that. And we started at very early explaining that to them to make sure they never feel like I did when I was young at heart. Because actually I, was, I grew up not knowing who I was, feeling like an alien. And I hear parents saying, oh, I'm not going to tell my child I'm this. Or I'm not going to tell my child, you know, what their label is. And actually it's so important because it means that they know who they are and they can embrace who they are. And yes, they know <coughs> the challenges it comes with, but actually you can support them through those and they can actually make sure they feel positive about it. And I think that's a huge thing because actually going through school for me without a diagnosis, I felt like an alien. I, you know, I did GCSEs, I never went any further. I didn't know why. I kept getting told I was intelligent, but should try harder, never ending with. Oh, yes. Um, and it creates imposter syndrome. It creates huge amounts of it. It creates so much perfectionist tendency. Because you're permanently told to stop fidgeting when, you to, when I'm talking to you. Look at me when I'm talking to you. All of those things. And if you let a child be them and you let them embrace that label, it means the mental health challenges will be far, far lessened, I think, as well. I think we've all probably been that child as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering, Naomi, if you um, could 
could talk to, could elaborate on some of the negative stigma stereotypes. I once sat with a doctor talking about my child and had a very in-depth conversation about all sorts of medical things at a fairly sensible level, or I would sort of say sensible level, probably far more in-depth than most people would do. At the end of it, I mentioned to him that I was autistic, and then he asked me if I wanted all the doses writing down, if I needed phoning for support to support me in looking after my child, and did I want any other involvement from any other services. Um, and that was a GP. Um, I spend a lot of time with those stigmas because I look after a lot of people within everything I do outside of work as well, where they are constantly faced by this presumption that people are going to look like one version of autism or one version of any particular uh, neurotype. And I think it's so important to make sure that we don't think like that. We look at autism at work programs, and I'm sorry to say it, um, because I know you might have one, but I would always say it's a neurodiversity at work program, because actually nobody ever has one. We all have a multitude, we all have a varying different set of things, and therefore we need to make sure that we actually embrace that and see everybody for their differences. And I think those stereotypes are the stigma in so many ways. It's those, you, you have to do things this way. You know, I was told recently I was rude on a video conference because I was not looking at the person and I was doing about 12 things simultaneously. And that's my ADHD kicking in. It doesn't mean I'm not listening. It means I'm probably actually listening far more effectively and we're back to doodling in some ways, you know, than I would be if I was sitting staring at a screen. Because when I'm staring at a screen, I'm doing it now. I'm like, am I sitting correctly? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? I've got all those voices in my head from when I was younger. Um, and I think those stigmas <coughs> are attached in so many different ways, you know. Um, what about the sort of because of, I don't know whether this is true for uh, you guys, but the fact that the all the research originally maybe, yeah, yeah so maybe um, all the research originally uh, around autism in particular and ADHD was done on essentially white boys, and so it has that you know what the stereotype of an autistic child. Is, and somebody with ADHD is an autistic one, and that has really not served yeah. us well. When I had my ADHD diagnosis, I said, can you sort of, I wanted to question about autism because I did think I had some traits, and I said, well, you can't be autistic because you're sociable and you're creative. I'm like, <laughs> and now I look back at that, and that was a, you know, a, a specialist. Yeah, yeah. See, so a lot of girls get missed because they're sociable. They try harder to fit in. I'm um, also hyperlexic and talk a lot, you know, and um, there's this thing about empathy because a lot of the boys, the canner kind of like subjects back yeah. in those days, um, a lot of those, they seemed like they had no empathy, but their empathy was different anyway. But, yeah. you know, that's a whole massive kind of stereotype as well. Um, I think a lot you know we talk about the extreme male brain theory of autism thanks to uh, uh certain professors who at the time you know that was you know autism was viewed as an extreme male brain um and even now when you look at ados and you look at a lot of the diagnostic assessments they are very much weighted towards male characteristics or what is perceived as male characteristics you know i am not the vision of what people have in mind when they think about somebody who is autistic. I don't struggle with eye contact. You know, I can talk and be sociable um, and, and engaging is just extremely exhausting. And I need, I, I get lots of social hangovers. So you're all contributing to my hangover tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, in that it takes a lot of effort and, and things that people don't see. And I think there are so many assumptions or people assume you might be coping in situations where there's a lot of masking going on. And this is where I think <laughs> we see, particularly in, in women, is a lot of you know social masking and also chameleon. You, you reflect the behaviors of what you see. And I've gone around my entire life just reflecting the people in and around me. I've, I've had multiple personalities depending on who I'm hanging out with, you know, and, and because I've never known how to be myself. And I think there's a lot of it in and around that. 
I was going to say, I mean, the other interesting one I found, we were talking about it earlier, is actually the combination of neurodivergencies actually leads to different things as well. The intersectionality, for instance, with me, I'm always curious about what I would have been like had I grown up now in a world where the gender fluid and non-binary and all of that side of things has come in because I was that kid who was sitting there on a farm in a pair of overalls never endingly not being who my mother expected me to be and not wearing the clothes and everything else between and I went through life not quite fitting in but I kind of had to and had to do this and had to do that because society said so and actually the conclusion I'm coming to is that the autism plus the ADHD in my case is actually leading to non-binary thinking because I find it with my son as well. He, he still calls everyone he or she, depending without any context which one is which. Um, he just doesn't see a binary. And I don't see the binary either a lot of the time. I really, unless it's because of social constructs, I don't recognize that binary at all. And I would be curious to have seen me now and actually know whether I would have been non-binary gender fluid or any of that side of things, because actually I know that I just don't see it or think about it. And I'm fascinated at the moment by that combination of ADHD and autism being in there. It's a very common yeah. Com yeah. It's I, very I'm, common. I'm yeah. You know, yeah, if I was a teenager now, I'd probably feel that I was non-binary. As, as a kid, I was a tomboy. I do, I, my mum used to make me wear this hideous party dress. I hated party dresses. Never wanted to wear. I also wanted to wear, tra you know, and have short hair and what have you. And yeah. <laughs> and. Um, I've, I've never been that sort of girly girl and I've always kind of, you know, in advertising, it's a really laddish culture as well. And I've sort of just I've been wanting to, you know, work with the lads and like do the work and everything. But then advertising is the most sexist culture as well. Only 12% of creative directors are female. And also, I definitely think I've sort of lost some work because of, I've actually been hired as a female because they've had a female audience. And then I've been fired because the men didn't like the work because it wasn't for them. It was female audiences. And it's just I, like... I got told I needed to tone down my challenging people's biases on gender because I was a female. And that was a that's a rich vein of so, yeah, so there's that kind of challenge because it's like I feel like I'm the same as them but they don't see me as the same as them so it's kind of really I used to be accused a lot of stealing other people's boyfriends or trying to and I was like no, they're just talking to me so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and generally actually communication's easier with men as well I have to say you know from my point of view I see a lot of cues on faces I see a lot of micro expressions Sorry. Um, so I do a lot of, with micro expressions and things. I actually learn and read people and expressions through that. And therefore, men generally, and I hate to say this to you all because I'm, I'm stereotyping slightly, are a lot simpler to actually read because what you're saying and what you're visually saying is fairly similar. Whereas actually with females, sometimes it's actually not the same at all. There's something coming out verbally that is actually not expressed visually. Whereas me, I was, it's all on my face. Yeah, I can't hide it. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, I had a nightmare once with that. Hey, I think there right. was a, just another interesting yes. point when we, when we were talking before about. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Because uh, these stereotypes are coming up in sort of e even even in the sort of EDI documents and and training that we get. And you made a really interesting thing about the attentive listening, wasn't it? Oh, you're awesome. Memory. <laughs> oh, yes. That's an int no, well, we won't go there. But um, the fact that attentive listening is not something. Oh, Robin, and he's like, let's move on. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> sorry. Um, anyway. Um, so it's probably important, sorry. It's probably important to say at this point that the labels and definitions like dyslexia are not very useful, particularly when it comes to adults. And I teach at the Royal College of Arts, so I'm, I'm working with adults all the time. Because 60% of us are a mixture of dyslexia and dyspraxia or ADHD and autism. And that's important because everybody needs specific and personalized adjustments. And we're going to talk about what makes a reasonable adjustment after the break. But I think now it would be a good time to take some questions from the audience. So if, yep, great. I'm going to run across with the microphone. 
And um, I think we'll just say who your question is addressed to. Oh, just everyone really. Um, I have experienced um, being told I am too direct and too honest um, when male colleagues are behaving in exactly the same way as I am. So how does the panel feel about those, I guess, sex-based differences in expectations of behaviour? Because I don't see why I should be behaving differently from a man in a professional setting. You turn around and tell them if they can do it, I can. Um, <laughs> would be my simple answer to that. You know, at the end of the day, we shouldn't be, and we should be challenging that conversation because it happens in every business. It has to be said still now. I've worked in IT for 20 years, and I spent 20 years in that very small minority at the very beginning of things of females in tech and battling that every day and I still do at times and I think it's difficult to stand up for yourself in a room at that like that but actually you have to and you have to try to keep doing it and finding groups that will support so women in tech groups and hearing other people talk and hearing conversations about imposter syndrome and the conversations about how to gain confidence and all of that side of things if you'd seen me 20 years ago I wouldn't have said boo to a goose. And I think that's, you know, a big difference to my diagnosis as well, quite frankly. I now feel who I am. I know who I am. And I don't apologise for who I am. So, I, this is something that I hear about a lot. Um, I was on a, listening to a panel event for International Women's Day, and I think this goes far beyond uh, neurodiversity, I think this is a, you know, a typical thing between, you know, women in the workplace, you know, we know that the incidences of women being spoken over uh, in, in meetings is much higher, there's research based on it, and I think there is that perception that if you stand up for yourself, you know, you are, you are abrasive, aggressive, you know, men are bullish, you know, or, or kind of, you know, they, they go get them. You know, I, I'm someone, my, my nickname at my first ever job was Wire Wool uh, because I was viewed by one of my colleagues, that's what he used to call me because I was so abrasive, um, you know, and nobody else got that, you know, nobody else had that type of view because you felt you have to stand up for yourself. I think, you know, this is part of a wider bias and I think it's you know tackling that and and you know calling them out on that or finding allies um, who can help you um, and it is tough particularly when you're starting out you know I feel quite confident now to challenge somebody um, if they call me difficult or abrasive uh, and I explain and I'll explain to them well this is why I reacted in that moment right I felt you know how because Nobody is aggressive or abrasive for no reason. It's usually in response to something because of how you're made to feel because you're not being heard, you're not being listened to. So sometimes by talking to that and saying, well, how, how do you want to deal with this? Like, how can we do some things differently so I don't feel I need to push back at that level and put it back on them? Other questions? Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Marcy. I'm friends with Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Um, I just wanted to bring something just to the table. It doesn't mean it's me to be a discussion, so I'm not asking the question, really. I'm sort of just sharing my experience. I'm neurodivergent, and I've worked in education for the last 30 years, if not longer, so I'm not going to say my age, but I've worked in education for a little while. And one of the things when we're talking about neurodiversity and something I'm passionate about is the intersectionality, which you mentioned. Now, as a, a black woman, who's neurodiverse, um, it, there's a lot of things there and I've had to deal with a lot of things as a child. Well, we go to the workplace, my first degree is in information science. So firewalls, security, web designing, you name it. So first I go into the interview, the panel doesn't look like me. I don't have any tennis clubs I've gone to. So I've got that as my first barrier. And as a woman and as a black woman, I've had to, tell and justify myself time and time again, the masking, the imposture, sabotage, I know it all very well. 
and that trauma to growth and understanding about love and self-care has been a journey. And I just wanted to bring that to the table because we tend to talk about neurodiverse diversity we tend to talk about lots of things lots of traumas the school experience I've got a list you know I had to go to therapy because they thought that my um, selective mute was to do with my home life but it was to do with the traumas of school so there's a list of things but I think it's really key even though we don't have that as a subject the intersectionality of race your environment your education plays an important impact has an important impact and plays an important part so I just wanted to mention that yeah. thank you for that <laughs> Yeah, on that subject, I just wanted to say that um, last week I was at a cross-party parliamentary group hosted by the British Dyslexia Association, and Matt Hancock, who's dyslexic, is presenting a bill in the autumn called the Dyslexia Screening Bill, and I mean, I'm not saying it's going to make a difference to you now, obviously it won't, but I think, you know, I would encourage as many people to sign um, so, so that's that every child will get a diagnosis? Every child will get a diagnosis, and um, part of teacher training, there'll be a mandatory part of teacher training to explain how to at least spot, identify dyslexic children, and, and best, best practice of, of teaching, reading, and writing, and spelling. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. problem. And also the fact that I've told my lot is dyslexic and I'm still going to go through diagnosis and they're still not supposed to be yeah. even yeah. though I've even told them. Yeah. 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 So but it's, it's a start. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. Can I just yeah, that? So we there's, are... a, there's a question from the remote audience as well that mm -hmm. asks oh. about is it, is it a legal requirement that once diagnosed and asking for reasonable adjustments in the workplace you need to give your employer a copy of your diagnosis. They say they feel very pressured to give their report to them, but without their permission, their direct manager mentioned their dyslexia during a team meeting, and so they were very embarrassed. Dyslexia so, would work now. Yeah. So uh, in a team meeting, the manager revealed their dyslexia to the rest of the team without their permission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting HR involved. But I'm realising that, that time-wise, I'm a oh, oh, I'm just going to say one thing. I don't think you hear me. The other flip side of that, and I, I, I know about his name, I can't see his name. Matt had a yeah, I saw him yesterday, <laughs> um, is that they're put, trying to put another bill through to say that you, if you don't have your maths and English, you cannot yeah, go exactly. to, you can't get your student loan. And that's an interesting one because marginalised communities and other things, you know, I didn't get my maths until I went as a mature student because of all the things that happened in my school. So we've got one thing happening at the top, it would be amazing having that early intervention, but the other side is another journey because not everyone gets the stage of equal education. So yeah, it's a bit worrying. Thank you. And and education is something obviously as a university, it's something we are obviously something we talk about a lot in terms of neurodiversity. Um, so I think we are going to draw to a close for this part of the um, this session of the debate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm confused because they changed. I know the time. time keeps changing. So um, drinks. drinks are available from the bar in the entrance space upstairs. But you're welcome also to stay here because um, Charm, who is, she tells me not an expert, but I think she's an expert in origami, is going to show us how to make a. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 u
Eight o'clock. Professor Sarah Rankin from Imperial College, no relation. Can people hear? No, no, no we can't. You can't? Oh. Well, I, is that better? Okay, I'll start again. Welcome back. For anyone who's just joined us, I'm Quona Rankin from the Royal College of Art, and my co host for this event is Professor Sarah Rankin from Imperial, no relation. We're both part of a staff student network called Neurodiversity in Albertopolis. And this evening, we've been discussing cognitive diversity in the context of business. Some of the more eagle-eyed of you will have noticed we're in the business school. But most importantly, we've been encouraging creative note-taking and doodling. And we have with us the wonderful Sean Weldon, who's, who's hiding at the moment, who is 
Sean, can you wave or something? Thank you. Um, who, who is going to be later on uh, doing, doing some doodling, doodling on the visualizer. And we'd like to invite anyone to interrupt the doodling at any point if they would like to take over. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, please just stick your, wave your hand if you can't hear and we're, I'll talk up a bit more. Um, what we were going to kick off this session with, so we've been doodling and the idea of doodling is that it, we, we, there is scientific evidence, there are experiments that have been done to show that actually when you doodle it does help you to concentrate and actually retain information. So uh, the point we were making is that, you know, we are still banning this in school and it's the most ridiculous thing. We were also talking, and I'm quite interested in how neurodivergent students uh, take notes. Um, and because I know that dealing with the medical students and certainly myself, I do a sort of lot of very multicolored notes when I was... Um, at university but things have moved on because now we have tech and so what I wanted to do was to introduce you to Tim Blunt who is from D and A and um, he's going to show you just um, to show people some of the uh, latest uh, software that we have invested in here at Imperial to help students and importantly all this software is available for all students so we wanted it to be very inclusive so um i'll let you explain yeah uh, um uh, so uh yeah uh, my name's tim nice to meet you all um but uh, i'm also neurodiverse uh, and i yeah when i get the opportunity i i jump on the the possibility of using the the tool that you can see behind me um, Somerset Audio Note Taker, uh, it, it is, uh, um, it's a really good way of just combining everything from, from a, uh, a talk or a class or whatever it may be. Um, you can, uh, um, uh, yeah, so you can see I've got three sections currently showing on the, the, the screen. We've got this images section where I've managed to, to capture some photos. Apologies to the, the panelists if they are not terribly flattering. Uh, um, but gives me the, the visual aspect of the, the, the talk of you know, being able to return to, oh yeah, I remember that. I can, I can see it through my eyes again, turning on the, uh, the, the, the uh, cinema screen in my head that uh, works for my memory. And more to the point, I've also been able to incorporate some notes. And then you can see over here in this section, on the, the larger section, it's giving me this audio section where we've got the series of bricks. But if I just quickly uh, um, play through a, uh, uh, um, yeah, we'll go for these ones that you can see I've marked as important. Uh, so, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and ADHD are all classified as specific learning disabilities. It's probably more... So, you, hopefully you could hear that, the, yeah, I marked that as important because that was where it was, you know, defined what, what uh, dyspraxia, dyspra dyslexia, dyspraxia, and ADHD are, are listed as. Um, but so it just means that I've got a much better way of able to find my way back to these things, particularly these text notes, they're useful, but even better, I can click on this chain link icon and you'll notice that SBLDs is now highlighted in the, uh, the section, as is that audio, of uh, uh, that audio brick just there. Similarly, if I click on working with people understanding, we can see that this section just here has come up highlighted. So it's just a, a really key way of being able to, if I don't make sense of my notes when I'm looking back at them later, I've got another way of being able to, to get back to it. So it just means that I'm spending less time uh, uh, trying to figure out what my notes mean when I'm looking back through those notebooks. I've actually got something that can tell me what those things actually mean. Uh, just, to, just to say for any, any students or staff, uh, um, as Sarah was saying, this is available for everyone. It's part of the Inclusive Technology uh, um, Project. And if you wanted to get the smartphone app, uh, there is this, this link app.sonascent.com that you can uh, um, visit and just put in your Imperial College email address uh, and get the free download of the app. Great, thanks, Tim. So uh, I just wanted to ask in the audience, anybody else use any sort of key accessibility software or apps? Interesting. 
One person. One person. Adrian's got his hand up. Yeah, well, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. IT. <laughs> Uh, I use a dragon for dictation um, as it lets me produce documents while I'm on the go and moving around a lot. Um, it took quite a while to train it to my accent, which I didn't think was uh, that objectionable, but um, it's a bit Essex and a bit Northern, so it struggled. But for anyone interested in dragon and who has an assistive tech department, I would Absolutely recommend it. Great. A specific app over there or no? Oh, right at the back there. I mean, so one of the things that we found really useful with our network is that we actually, our soldiers learn from the students in terms of <laughs> the, the apps and things that actually can be really useful. Um, I've used the same audio note taker. Uh, like this for my um, tutorials and revisions. And I'm also using a lot of MindView, um, which has actually completely changed how I take notes and actually made me I, I, able to find them. And similarly, I dictate a lot of my notes, but th they don't love a Geordie accent. <laughs> I mean, it, it's hard as well with a lot of the scientific terminologies that we use. Um, but yeah, mind mapping. Anybody else a fan of mind mapping? Because that's a great way of, you know, I think one of the things about neurodivergent people, we tend to sort of think about the sort of disparate links between everything. Everything is linked to everything in our minds. And that's part of the problem. And that's part of my problem in terms of trying to linearize things into text. Um, but yes. Um, right, moving on. The, the, the questions. The question. Right, thank you, Tim. And I think Sean's going to show us some of the notes. Oh, you're, you're just going to put some of the, the doodles <laughs> I'll just on put, there. I'll just put them up. So yeah, the fire doodling. Sarah, I think we need to reintroduce our panellists. Oh, did we do that? The people who okay. just... I thought we'd done that, sorry. Can I, st can yeah. I start, please, um, with introducing Helen Needham. Helen, can you give us... <laughs> she works for CAPCO and she's won numerous awards. She's also given a TED, TED Talk X. Um, Helen is autistic and hosts a website, Needy Coded, for blogs around neurodiversity. We've also got... Lucy Hobbs. I'm a freelance creative director and I founded The Futures ND, which is a, um, a neurodiverse network for um, creative and tech. Sorry, I'm just giggling at the subtitle saying you're a freelance crazy director. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, Naomi Johnson, I work in neurodiversity as well um, in Amazon, but I'm not doing that for them right now. Uh, I'm autistic, ADHD, dyspraxic, dyslexic. Hi, and I'm Richard Addison. I'm a partner in EY. I'm ADHD. I'm uh, dyslexic as well. I look after our neurodiversity network. Great. Okay, so um, obviously uh, specific learning differences or dis disabilities and autism are protected characteristics under the Equalities Act. Um, so, you know, I think I remember somebody, people make comments like, oh, you won't get extra time at work. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, getting extra time is, is the thing. Actually, the, the interesting thing that we have done with our, we, we, I have one exam, which is a data analysis exam, and it's a 45-minute exam. I just make it two hours for everybody. And I think, it, I think that's the way we should be moving. Right. Um, so what I'm trying to think about now is the reasonable adjustment. So how does this play out in the workplace? Um, you know, obviously the extra time is an option. So what do reasonable adjustments look like in the workplace? What are the types of things we, people can request? So I had a bit of a 
Yeah, it's just long. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Were you in time? Yeah, is that better now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I, I had my uh, formal diagnosis about five, six years ago, and one of the recommendations was that I had my own office in a private space, and um, we have a op completely open plan, busy office. So I'm friendly with our managing partner, and I pointed out to him that I should have my own office, which he didn't respond to, and I um, then said that everyone who sat around me would also like me to have my own office. <laughs> <laughs> I am incredibly disruptive to others around me in the office. Anything, anything other than my work is interesting. Um, for me, what's been important is the teams and the people around me. I've had the same secretary for uh, 20 years, and I would not be able to function without her. She reminds me what I need to do. She puts everything in place, and she basically is the good me, and I'm the bad me, and we together we work things out. But most people don't have that opportunity, and it's there are some reasonable adjustments we make, but it's pretty hard actually. It's really hard to to really get reasonable adjustments into the workplace. I think the manager's understanding or the people who are managing people understanding how to use people's strengths is super important. And we do still get people on performance improvement plans that go around, you know, you'll get somebody with dyslexia with the comment being, so-and-so is highly creative, but their work isn't very precise. And you go, well, what were you expecting? And so I think a lot of issues around education, um, but it's challenging. Um, I'm going to pass on to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. I don't know if I've, I don't know if I put myself in that bracket, but um, I think, and um, for me, so in the workplace, I've, I've never formally asked for a reasonable adjustment. Um, what I have done is engage in conversations around how do we work differently. So one of the big differences for me in the workplace is. I'm not a big fan of surprises. So I, I talked about um, uh, being seen as confrontational. And it's usually when somebody decides to share their innovative kind of great thinking in a meeting um, when we'd had a pre-agreed plan. And my brain is going, does not compute, does not compute. This is not what we discussed. Why are you bringing me something different? Um, I love innovation, I love novelty, just not right now. And so my adjustment is, if you've got a bright idea, email it to me ahead of time so I have time to process it. And, and that's it. You know, that enables me to respond and then I'm not going to react kind of like, you know, something out of, you know, uh, Dante, um, you know, Inferno kind of hell um, bound creature, uh, which I can become if you spring a surprise to me uh, when I expect one thing and you give me something completely different. I'm, what I've also, and, and one of the things that I'm, you know, I do a lot at Capco in terms of working with people to understand, because quite often people don't know what adjustments they need. And I think a lot of the times what we find is that it's the smallest of things. It's an understanding manager who is willing to talk to you about how can we do things differently. Maybe we're not having all of our, you know, providing all of the instructions verbally, right, over, over a meeting, and therefore the person struggling to keep track of all of it is documenting it and sending it in an email uh, so they can process it. You know, um, working memory and processing speed means that that can be really difficult. Um, and I think a lot of these things, when we look at what adjustments really mean, it's just about being open-minded to do things a little bit differently um, and potentially in a different space. You may not have your own office, but I'm sure there's a quiet space and, you know, a little hideaway hole that people go that's free of TVs and free of people. You know, for us, we have a basement and nobody goes down into the basement apart from the neurodivergence. And you see us all hanging out kind of, you know, and it's a bit like a library. You know, you get a look and a shush if you make too much noise. Um, you know, but we also have little pods that people can go to. So if you want to make noise, you can go and disrupt the uh, wall. 
um, you know, and I think this is about each of us, you know, finding a space that works for us. Um, and, and I think that's what a lot of adjustments are about, really. Moving on to that piece as well, actually, the other thing we talk about is actually menus and actually creating a menu for adjustments because, and again, I mean, this is personal experience of my life. I don't know what adjustments I need a lot of the time, going back to that. Not only that, but when I, as a disabled person, as a neurodivergent, go, I need this adjustment. Actually, I'm asking for the bare minimum. I'm asking for the little bit I think is not going to trouble anyone, you know, just because of who I am. And actually, if you give people a list of these are all the adjustments we've done, that way they don't feel like they are going to be saying, can I have this? Can I have that? But also you're saying these are absolutely reasonable, but there are more as well. And I think that allows people to have that open conversation, not ask for the bare minimum. And you need to make managers and leaders aware that actually when somebody's coming to you, it's probably a last resort. And therefore, they need to actually explore what else will help as well as that one thing they've asked for. I think yes. that's the other thing that's really important to talk about. Just a little bit about the recruitment process. Yes. In terms of the yeah, because I mean, that's a really... Recruitment processes. Oh, only my existence. Um, so recruitment processes at the moment are one size fits all. You go through and you do what you're meant to do and then you go out the other side. If you could create, again, back to menus, a recruitment process that had different sort of pathways and you could say, as somebody who is neurodivergent and doesn't do peopling, I'd prefer to do this test and then do this conversation this way. Whereas somebody like me would say, actually, I'd prefer to do the interviews like this, but can I do them over two days? Because actually, I, if I process for two hours, I then have absolutely that I can't do anymore. So actually looking at that and starting to explore how you interview and not going for a one-size-fits-all benefits, not just the neurodivergent folk, but actually everybody. Because we all communicate differently. We all present differently. We all do everything differently. And actually a multitude of ways of doing it helps everybody. Right. Uh, one of the things that's been a real revelation to me in terms of interviews is the uh, giving the questions 24 hours beforehand. Yeah. And what you find is, you know, just better quality answers. And actually people are then, you know, when you ask a question in an interview, you tend to put your whole life in and say everything in that, try and incorporate everything because you don't know what's coming next. And so I think it, it helps you to give better quality. Is that... I'm typing them. Oh, I'm typing. Sorry, I wouldn't type. If you're on a video interview, which we all are at the moment, or have been for a long time, if you actually type the question as well and actually put it into the chat window, it allows that person to then process it, look back at it. Because actually when you're sitting there nervous in an interview, you'll hear the first five words, six words, seven words. Think about that bit and not actually listen to the rest of the sentence. So actually doing that allows people to go back, refer to it, look at it, understand it, and keep themselves on track as well. Yeah. I never do. Yes. But it, yeah, and I think the, the, one of the things that is coming out of this is that a lot of these are very small things and they don't cost anything. It's just people being prepared to do things in a slightly different way. And yeah, brilliant. So, so Lucy. <laughs> Thinking about my answer, actually, I've got, I've got, there's so many things I can say, but I'd say that, um, you know, as a freelancer, I would never um, declare that I, that I have ADHD um, or autistic because um, I would worry that um, they wouldn't hire me or I wouldn't get any more work. And also, working in the advertising industry, it's pretty ruthless, and um, I just don't know if they would take you, me seriously. I don't know, but I think there, there's much more kind of activity now and there's much more kind of understanding of it. Um, and it's also really highly competitive. So I've been a freelancer most of my career, but I have tried to go for full-time jobs and um, there's thousands of applicants. You know, I tend to get, I know I will sometimes get down to the last two, we'll have an interview brief and then I don't get the project because someone had full-time work you know so it could be I'm a freelancer or it could be because in an interview I do talk a lot and go off on tangents so but I'm not sure because I've never sort of said you know be honest with me um but I just now I just work for myself so sometimes I freelance in agencies I do neurodiversity consultancy work and I 
organize events um and now you know i get a project that's two days work and i can spread it over a week i can go horse riding i can i can do what i want i can work from home and also covid has been brilliant for a lot of people um a lot of people have sort of enjoyed that because now all my con my events i do my panels on zoom which um saves me also the traveling and you know i'm always exhausted the day after but i've kind of saved quite a lot of time you know with the traveling and the meeting people and the, that that kind of thing um and it's just really interesting how a lot of disabled people you know people in wheelchairs people who are autistic neurodivergent have been fighting for ages to be able to work from home and have flexible working and then you know covid happened and able bodies you know people's life was in danger and overnight everyone was working from home and a lot of people are really enjoying that now so that's that's a good thing that's come out of covid brilliant okay so so let's just take this now from the manager's perspective um and i'm thinking about either you being nd and managing people that are not or thinking maybe Richard, in terms of, because the, the, the title of this is Cognitive Diversity. So let's just have a little, maybe, thoughts on cognitive diversity and what the benefits of that are to the team, the organisation, the business, etc. and how you try and, you know, how you think about that. Maybe I can start at the sort of right-hand side at the end and say, what are we dealing with at the moment? Well, anything that's routine can be put into computer programs, can be automated, but lots of things happen in very fluid, rapidly changing environment. There are lots of crises, et cetera. So if you look at that, say, end goal, look at that right-hand side, and you say, well, what do you need to do to solve problems, to solve situations which are complex, maybe crisis management, well, you need a diversity in the team. You need to be able to deal with the evidence at that point in time, design a solution, because you don't have a process that's going to get you there. You have to somehow solve that problem. So it's pretty obvious that a diverse, cognitively diverse team is going to perform to a high, is going to perform well. But often we don't select those, those teams. We select teams that are the same. We look for the same in other people. I use a term which annoys people at work. We sort of look for a renaissance man, and I use the term man with deliberately. And, um, you know, somebody who's in, in other people's eyes are good at everything. They don't exist. It's all a fallacy. It's, it's self. It's, it's sort of it's, it's a protection mechanism. So we need to get different people in place. How do we do that? How do we get people high performing? We need to have safety because People who are cognitively diverse, they're going to, make, uh, they're going to feel uncomfortable often, often have uh, more mental health challenges, may, have, um, may feel that they're more prone to making mistakes, can't bring themselves to work. And how do you create an environment to combine all those different skills so you get something which is greater than the sum of the parts? And I think that's the secret for the future. And you've got to be deliberate about doing it. It can't be, oh, if we... If we're nice, it will happen. You've got to be deliberate. What does the situation demand? And not talk about activities people are going to do. Talk about the behaviors and what they bring to the team as individuals. I am this person in the team. This is what I'm going to do. And I think it's a very different way of working to what we're used to. But it's what we're probably going to need in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm conscious of time. Um, so um, and I'm thinking now. Oh, 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 oh. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Abby. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Don't worry, I'll sit next to Naomi. So, um, so. I think it's fair to say that all these people here are ND advocates and they've all been really important in terms of this uh, the sort of ND movement that is happening and, and trying to push for change. And, and one of the ways that you are doing that is by setting up the, the staff networks um, and 
whether you have evidence of impact of those staff networks. So are you recruiting more neurodiverse people? Are you uh, showing that they have better well-being or teams being more productive? And anything along those lines? I know it's sort of quite early days. I don't know, when did you set up your ERG, I think they're called, business terms? So at, at Capco, it's, um, it's four years since I uh, came out in the workplace as, as autistic and announced my desire to set up a neurodiversity ERG. Um, and um, to, to our managing partner and the head of HR, uh, at that point, neurodiversity was not something that we spoke about. In fact, um, one of the first things I did, or I was asked to by a managing partner and said, yes, we're behind this. Do you mind telling your story to our leadership team? Um, and, and that's the first step I took. I uh, stood in front of all of them, berated them around their performance management process, told them that uh, development of gravitas is not a development trait, um, and, and talked to them about all of the ways in which we ask us our, our, our people to be themselves at work, unless you're dyslexic and don't pay attention to detail, which is a death knell for any management consultant. Like, lack of attention to detail in a client presentation, you know, and, and I've seen so many people kind of really struggle with, with that because they're up all night and day trying to correct these errors um, that they need to speak up more, be the social animal, you know, it's all about networking. And I went through all of these different scenarios around how you can't be yourself at work because you don't fit the model of what we promote as a, as a successful uh, consultants. And um, it was an impactful session. Um, there were tears, mine, uh, and others. Um, but I think it really resonated with a lot of people in the room. Um, we went from, someone was like, that's a really great word. Did you make it up? Um, and I'm like, no, you can't claim that. You know, Judy Singer would not forgive me if I said yes. Uh, she's amazing. She's an amazing woman. If you haven't read kind of the work that she's done to start this all off, go and read her paper. Um, it, it's phenomenal. Um, to now, four years later, we have a working group that meets every two weeks. We yeah. have representatives from HR, we have representatives from recruitment, our DEI team, our learning and development team, our business ops team, and key parts of the business. And we have one mission, which is to understand the employee journey and the key challenges on that journey and identify what can we do differently to bring about change for neurodiversity inclusion. Uh, and we focus on this every two weeks and we have a range of initiatives. So we have had someone come in and film around the office to do an office tour so that we can provide uh, new recruits uh, or potential recruits that they can see the office before they come for interviews or before they return to the office from, um, from, from COVID. We have seen um, more people declaring that they're neurodiverse uh, on the uh, applications to, to during recruitments, we've seen a significant rise because we do a lot of, well, um, publicity on LinkedIn and uh, public blog posts. And, and by that, I do a lot of sharing on our behalf, not all of it with formal staff, <laughs> but, um, but we do have a blog posts and we're talking about it. and young people are coming in and what we're seeing is people going this is the first time that i've been engaged with and actually that i feel that i can talk about this and there are a couple of young um, associates who, who have joined and you know they're saying that they feel validated in who they are they feel empowered to talk up so it is not uncommon for somebody to start a meeting and go, by the way, I have ADHD, this is what I need, um, at the start of a meeting. And, and, and we go, okay, well, this is me, this is what I need. And these are conversations that weren't happening four years ago. In fact, it took us so well in the UK, I was invited to establish a global ability network. We now have neurodiversity networks in Canada, in um, 
the US in Brazil and uh, Hong Kong. And we're all now coming together globally to look at how do we change things at a global level. Um, so, you know, you can make a difference starting as one. Brilliant, brilliant. I mean, another Anybody else to add to that? I mean, we, yeah, it's a really good example. Probably have some bit to add. Yeah, just because you're really yeah. personal. I'm personal right now. I'm personal right now. <laughs> um, I, I think one thing I've recognised in all of this, again, back to that personal journey and how it creates safe spaces is the other thing it does create is conversation where people self-recognize all of a sudden. And actually that's been the other thing is people reaching out going, this is me and I didn't even realize it. Or a conversation about medication that says, thank you for talking about it. I feel so stigmatized with it. I now feel I can talk about it. I now feel validated. And I think that's the other huge one we've been seeing along the way in lots of spaces is actually the self-recognition, especially of our lost generation, back to that conversation again of, those of us who have been late diagnosed and actually still are being because people don't even know that's who they are until they hear a story from somebody else who says it and they say, that's me too. And I think that's the other big thing is that one-on-one one -on -one conversation as opposed to the education. Yeah. I just want to give an example of just a great conversation that I had uh, this week and that somebody uh, reached out to me as a manager and they said, hey, Helen, uh, I've got someone, they've talked to me about being neurodivergent. Um, can you chat to me about how, how do I approach this conversation? And, you know, this is someone I've known for five, six years, and, and they've come on the journey. And as he talked to me and he said, OK, so this young person came in and they talked about this and they said, I'm neurodivergent. And, I'm, and, and they started listening. And he just said to me, I, or to, and he conveyed back to me and he said, well, the first thing I said was, well, what does that mean for you? And that as this young person provided an explanation, is like sometimes it takes me a little bit longer, sometimes I need more support. And the manager came back and was like, okay, but that's something that I do for everyone who works with me. And, you know, we're seeing more and more managers coming forward who are wanting to engage in that conversation, who are looking for direction and guidance, to, who are saying, I know this is important, I don't know where to start, can you help me? And, you know, we talked earlier about the importance of management and support. I mean, that, that is the greatest adjustment that, that you can have. And to see managers and also senior people within the organization choosing to stand behind this and say, this is important. This is something we care about. And putting it on the board level agenda is phenomenal. Um, you know, and I think that is the power. Um absolutely amazing and now but i'd also turn it around a little bit if i may to, to a different to, to look at it to a slightly different lens um my, the best man of my uh, my best man was he's an environmentalist and, and he claims you always have to create economic value to really embed environmental values in society he's very, very passionate about that and I think if we look at organizations, that also you have to go back to, well, what's the benefit? And there's a, we work with, a, there's a hedge fund in the East Coast, which is in, investing on ESG basis, and they've been doing a lot of research through academics. And it's clear that for long-term high performance, safety, diversity, and purpose are, are the drivers of motivation, and motivation gives rise to economic performance. And for, for me, the number one thing is safety. If people feel safe in the workplace, they will bring me solutions. They will speak up. Because the solutions normally in your team, the people you work with normally have better information. They're closer to the evidence. They're closer to what's going on. They can make better decisions. They just have to tell you. And for me, I need to be challenged. I can make really bad decisions. I'm ADD. I get fixated with something. I'm convinced it's right. Somebody has to challenge me. Somebody has to push back. I need that interaction. And, and to my mind, with that safety, you will get that. You get all that balance. And, it's, and it's, it benefits everyone. It doesn't just benefit the people who do it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, the other thing, actually, on the flip side of that, though, is actually making sure the conversation is balanced enough to ensure that the company and the managers and the everyone above also understands it's not just about the word that you hear bandied around superpowers, for instance. 
it's actually making sure that conversation doesn't happen because actually you're then putting pressure on people to be something and to hide almost their challenges because what you're turning around saying is that everyone who is autistic for instance is going to have all these superpowers and they're going to make our business better and blah 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 and actually that's not a balanced conversation either and you need to make sure that that balance is there um just as a yeah i think everybody has potential and i think a lot of this is how do we identify that potential in someone and then how do we create a working environment in which they're able to fulfill their potential? And some of us, you know, and that potential will look different in each and every one of us. Um, you know, and the environment we need to be successful will look different for each and every one of us. And I, you know, in, in terms of the benefits, and absolutely agree, you know, the Edelman Trust Report talks about the impact of building trust and the difference that that makes with inclusion and engagement. And, I was talking about that book a little bit earlier about Matthew Syed and Rebel Ideas. I'm just going to quickly say so. So I'm glad this is all being recorded for Imperial Senior Management. <laughs> <laughs> Universities, I would say, are not in the same place as businesses. And this is something that obviously with our network is, is, is where the change needs to be. Um, so, so yes. Um, and, and actually, I mean, an interesting fact, because a lot of people uh, have been talking about nerds <laughs> and as being scientific nerds. And, and I think the assumption is that there are a lot of neurodivergent scientists. But, I mean, well, the, the Royal Society has um, recently done, you know, evaluated this and done all the stats, looked at the, all the data. And their data suggests that only 0.9% of academics are neurodivergent. That is shocking. That is shocking. So what's going on? Is it, I mean, either way, it's shocking because it's people that don't disclose because they don't feel safe to disclose. Um, or it's people that um, don't realise that they are um, different. So, so I would encourage anybody from Imperial, any academics, please think about this. I just um, wanted to read uh, a, a very short quote from, from this book by um, Matthew Side, who's not known as sort of being a neurodiverse activist. Um, and this was written in 2019. And he said, unless you take into account the diversity of individuals, you're likely to design systems, guidelines, and much else that are defective or restricting or both. Um, and I think it would be really interesting, Sarah, to hear if anybody here has anything they want to say about systems that they've found within their um, organizations that they work for that have that have worked really well for them that they'd like to share or anyone from the panel as well thank you so um my name is grace bolton i am actually a colleague of richard's so at EY and we've been absolutely overwhelmed this week by celebrating Neurodiversity Week, just the support from the firm. And I think actually it's great to see everyone here. But I think it's a bit more, I guess, of a question when you're talking about the management systems. And yes, we have this hierarchical society where we look up to our leaders and actually our leaders are the ones that can influence change. But going back to your superpowers or everyone, leaders are expected to be good at everything because they got to that point. So actually having authentic leaders that it's okay to be bad at something because actually <clears throat> neurodiversity has that spiky profile. So I guess being dyslexic, I struggle to get a question out and more I should probably just um, waffle on, but it's probably like, how do we approach 
making it okay for our leaders not to be good at everything because actually I think rightly or wrongly that's how we might get the most change but you still have to create that environment so it doesn't take a generation for that change to happen. So the one thing I would say is one way I could answer, I'm not good at heart surgery. I don't think any of you would want me to operate on your hearts. Like, it is not a skill that I have, right? I am good at data analysis and I have skills that I'm good at. I'm not good when it comes to my socialization skills. Now, does that mean I'm not good at it or is that just a skill that I don't have? And I think when we start to focus on our skills, what we have and view that decoding letters and numbers is a skill, you just, that is not your key skill. You have skills in other areas. And I think a good leader recognizes what they're skilled at and focuses on that and recognizes the skills of the people around them that are complementary to their own and they build collaborative partnerships. Um, there is no single leader in the world that has, is skilled in everything. They all have teams around them. You know, they all build teams around them. They don't achieve the success on their own. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of Brene Brown who talks about, you know, authentic leadership and, you know, daring to sit there and, and not try and put yourself there as the full package. I don't think any of us are. Um, you know, and I think when we start to be open about that, we take a lot of the pressure off ourselves um, to not be everything in all areas and to focus on what are our skills, our potential, and, you know, how do we make the most of those? That, that's my thoughts on it. Just give a very quick example. There's, for one thing, nobody would ever think that I'm good at everything. That's not a problem I have. But, um, but there's a partner who, um, a partner who I've worked with on and off over about 25, 20 years or so. And I was talking to him the other day and I'm saying, I said, I'm sorry I'm so disruptive and disorganized things so much and I really value having you around. But he's hyper analytical and very structured. And he said, you don't realize that you keep me safe you see things before they happen, I deal with them and help you get the responses afterwards. But I feel very exposed without you around because I don't see things coming early enough. So I didn't realize that. And he, and I hugely value him. He makes me safe as well. And I think if you recognize how that there's symbiotic relationships and you disclose the weaknesses, I think it's better for everyone. I think definitely we're back to the surrounding yourself with team members. You recognize your weaknesses. I mean, I was having a conversation a little bit earlier where I wouldn't tell them that I've got some people who support me at times, and I would call them my reasonable adjustments in some ways. They're my program managers. They keep me under control <laughs> because my brain bounces around. It does big thinking. You try and get me to put it on paper. You try and get me to put it in order that everyone else will understand, and you're scuppered. You know, I will go into a meeting and talk like I am now, but I will think also that I'm waffling and I'm being all over the place, and actually sometimes I'm not and I don't recognise it. And people tell me that and actually make me realise my strengths as well. And that's yeah. Sorry, I might bounce. No, no, no. Um, I mean, it's just a really great discussion and it's really great to hear your insights um, and obviously coming from a lot of experience and, and a lot of time sort of working in this space and trying to sort of navigate it. And because when you work in the EDI space, you suddenly realise that actually those making that change happen is it's a very different skill set, isn't it, it to your day job, <laughs> which is data analysis, etc. So, yeah. Um, so I'm really conscious of time. Um, 
I know, so what I'm thinking of doing is ask is to sort of go to the wrap up question and and then we might have anybody that wants to ask further we'll have a q and a after and then anybody that needs to to leave or wants to get off so so we at the, sort of at the start of this we i was saying about the neurodiversity movement and and helen was saying you know four years ago that she set up her staff network and i think it it you know it, it we can sense that it's building um, momentum and just from a number of people in this room is just incredible and it's brilliant to see that. So yesterday, um, Dan, Harris, Dan Harris from Deloitte launched the Neurodiversity in Business as a charity at an event at the House of um, Commons. And this is going to, um, he hopes, consolidate activities of ND advocates like um, we have here and share best practice across business. Why aren't we doing this in universities? I ask myself. Anyway, um, given that we have the change makers with us here tonight, um, I wanted to ask you what next? So, you know, you've, you're changing the narrative with respect to neurodiversity, challenging the stereotypes, um, obviously changing the way that you work and that you allow others to work so that they can have better well-being, be more productive, etc. cetera. Um, so what are the other challenges? What's the next? What's the next? What are the challenges we should be addressing for the ND community? I've got something to say from the, what you were saying last time. I didn't, I didn't ask that question. <laughs> no, but I just wanted to say that... Um, I just think that, and this may be a change, but it's a gradual thing. I don't think anything changes overnight. But I think what's happening now is, especially with Neurodiversity Celebration Week, I have seen so many people coming out talking about their neurodivergence. And um, I set up the Futures ND like four years ago, you know, to create a platform to raise the voices of neurodivergent people for people to come and to be open and talk about um, themselves in, in, in advertising. And I had some like real leaders, you know, top people coming and talking like Ian Preston was in campaign. And I've seen so many people now there's the 50 neurodivergent women, and I've seen people like sharing that, talking. There's so many people talking about it now. It's actually becoming normalised, and it wasn't normalised before. And I think that's where we're at, and that's 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 brilliant. I think, from my side of things, I think the next step, or one of my next stages, I think that's probably better. One of my next stages is actually children is actually getting them to understand who they are early enough that actually the imposter syndrome, the perfectionist tendencies, all of those things are actually minimised before they even start. Actually being able to accept labels, accept who you are, and teach it from the very beginning. Teach mental health and self-care from the very beginning as well. There's a lady called Kit Messenger who did who's amazing. And she talks about, you know, how much dopamine you need and how much this and how much that and all the buckets that you have and how quickly they fill up. And she teaches it to children. And they learn how to self-care from a really early age. They learn when they need a break and to actually say, I need some time, I need to relax. I don't need to do activities right now. Actually, I need to stop. And it's not me being lazy. It's because what I need right now is to stop. And actually having that voice to be able to say that because actually... A lot of the time when children say, I need this, we sometimes, or a lot of the time in some cases, say, don't be, diff don't be silly, don't be difficult, or whatever else in between. We need to hear those voices, let them speak as well, and actually make sure that the generation at the very beginning know who they are and are accepted for who they are. So actually, by the time they get through, we're actually not in this stage in this conversation, quite frankly. You know, we don't need to at that point. So for me, uh, left-handedness. Um, so, and, and the reason I talk about that is because I am left-handed. Uh, 10 to 15% of the population are left-handed. Interesting comparison with neurodiversity, and yet I don't need to disclose that I am left-handed in the workplace, you know, but I do need adjustments. Like, you know, 
a lot of the world is made for right-handed people. It makes sitting next to me in a restaurant really difficult around a round table because we keep banging elbows. Um, you know, I, I like to see that there is a continuous uh, desk uh, for people to write notes. When I went to uni, we all used to have a, a desk with a little bit that came out of the chair and it was on the wrong side. It was made for right-handed people. Um, so for me, I want my neurodiversity to be considered in the same way as my left-handedness, not as a medical condition, but as a difference. Um, and that you know, a lot of the role bias that we have around what does successful look like for particular roles is tackled and addressed. And we start to focus on for that individual, how do what how do I make that individual successful in, in a role? How do I build a role around the individual? And we move on from talking about neurodiversity and, and differences, talking about reasonable adjustments because we've embraced universal design. If we embrace universal design, we lower the bar for reasonable adjustments and that we don't need them, it's an overhead, and that we can then select in, right, what works for us based on our needs. So that, that's the next step for me, is making it mainstream. I absolutely agree with everything that's been said and I would, for me, the three things. The one is, this is, we're learning as we, change that nobody i think has all the answers at the moment and we when, as we move forward we need to learn and i think we need to also be very to understand the way that people need to think or behave certainly in our environment in the future is not the same as what made people successful in the past and we need to understand that as well and for me this may sound rather forensic but i do think we need to measure things we need to have evidence because you don't win your arguments without measuring and proving your hypothesis and we need to do things like measuring safety and if we can measure safety we can then work out what elements of safety are missing is it that people can't bring themselves to work maybe that element's okay maybe people are deliberately undermined because it's a hyper-competitive environment. That also reduces safety. Are people allowed to make mistakes? Because that is an element of experimentation and can be an element of safety in the workplace. We need to measure and work out what we need to do differently. I think the other thing that I'm recognizing working in space, I work in there and I will bring that briefly in, is that actually we really need to recognize that in the UK, in North America, we're at a very different stage in our journey and a very different stage of understanding. And actually that needs to come into it as well because actually if you look at different countries, different cultures, different stigmas, different areas, and where their disability journey is at and therefore where their neurodiversity journey is at is a very different place. And actually that needs to be thought about as well back to the intersectionality conversation is actually that needs to be brought into the conversation as well as actually if you're working in a global, that conversation needs to happen too because you have to have a standard a gold level of what you expect to happen, that you roll over everything, no matter where it is. Yes, you understand there's a cultural difference, it's going to take time, but this is the standard we expect, this is what we expect for everybody. And that way you're actually making sure that it is for everybody across the globe, as opposed to in countries where we're at a further point in our journey. So, on behalf of NDIA, I'd like to thank Sean Weldon for taking us back to our doodling days, DNA for bringing us back to the 21st century, and to all our panellists for taking part in this lively and very interesting debate and helping us to see the potential of the future. And finally, thank you to you, all the audience, for listening and contributing and we hope to see you online or in person at future ND events. And also a big thank you to Adrian for all the IT support. So great. So um, yes, finally, just, just to give you a heads up, um, we are next sort of major event and the, the uh, first, I think, for um, NDIA will be the Neurodiversity Festival, which is going to happen um, in as part of the Great Exhibition Road Festival, and that will be on Sunday the 19th 
of June. So put that date in your diary if you want to hear more. And we will, yeah, we will be having some artists, scientists, etc., talking about actually what they do, some of their their great um, neurodiverse outputs and creativity, etc. So it'll be another. Jim. And we have Jim. Yes. Jim doing some doing talk about design. I don't know what I'm going to do, but yeah. <laughs> well, you know, last minute, dyslexic, last minute. Yep. Great. So, um, really looking forward to that. And thanks everybody for coming tonight. And please, yes, yeah, stay in touch. Questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> Anybody that wanted to ask questions to our panel, you're welcome to stay for questions, but I realise it's really